So, hasn't been a lot going on in the world of making drums or doing little projects. Mostly I've been busy just earning the money and uh, dealing with winter in as small a dose as I have to take it. Now, I've never really talked much about all the tools that I use to build my drums. And one of those tools was something I had to create entirely from inside here in order to do a specific job. So anyway, we'll take a look around the garage and around my very messy workbench and take a look at the new storage shelves that I put up in my drum storage room. got into modifying my own drums and later on making them, the most important tool I invested in was a table saw. Now I'll grant you this isn't the greatest model, but it was good for the budget at the time and I've done many a project on this thing, even had to repair it a time or two just to keep the thing moving. Uh, eventually I'll get a permanent shop space and then I'll get a proper table saw. But until then these job site saws seem to do the trick. Now the one limitation that this thing has is that this fence here is only good for about 11 inches. So, set to its outermost limit, it's only about 11 inches. Well, what happens when you get into something like a bass drum or a floor tom-tom where you need 12 to 18 inches of depth? Well, in a lot of wood shops, it's very common to see them using various kinds of sleds to go on their table saws. Usually it's a cross-cut sled, but I've seen all kinds of special hardware built for special jobs. So I decided to build something like that for my own humble little table saw. So instead of using this here fence, I decided to make a sled of my own. Now, you can see on the bottom here, ordinarily, you put some kind of a strip underneath here to go in these T-channels right here. Rather than do that, because it wasn't quite working out the way I wanted it to, instead I made guides that run along the outer edges of the table and keep things more or less square and aligned that way. I have this thing that can slide hither and thither over the surface of the table. Now let's look at how the rest of this thing works and how it's designed. So one of the features that's pretty common to a sled is that you have some way of keeping separate pieces together on either side of the uh, saw blade area. And then I needed something to hold the shelf. So what I did was I bought some T-channel off of Amazon and kind of this little T-track system. When I made these little roller guides, I bought a couple of rollers off of Amazon, got some three quarter inch birch plywood, and attached a little piece of T-rail to that, and then made an adjustment screw so that I can space these things out as needed. Now the next thing I needed to do was build some kind of a depth stop so that we know how deep the shell is gonna be. So I made this channel right here, which serves two purposes, number one, it holds this backstop roller, which I made out of a skateboard wheel, and I made some markings on there so that I know where the depth is going to be in relation to the saw blade and where that wheel is. And so I've got it set to 9 inches there, which is handy because we've got a 9 inch deep shell. Now, of course, it's not hitting the rollers, so I'll adjust these. And these are not marked. I set this by eyeball. And what I'm doing here, I'm setting the edge of the shell kind of in the middle of this little skateboard wheel. And then that way it can go through the rollers with this wheel acting as with this wheel acting as the backstop. And then we raise our saw blade here. So I can slide the table into the blade area when I'm ready to make the cut and roll it through. And then when I'm done with the cut and I see that the blade's not touching anything, I hit the power switch, wait for the blade to stop, and I can pull this back and take the shell out. Now usually only freehand a shell like that when I'm dealing with something really small like a six or an eight inch shell and I might have a fairly shallow cut. However, 
I wanted to guard against the possibility of the shell drifting this way into the saw blade and screwing up my cut. And that's where this guy comes in. This thing comes out over the guide roller, over the backstop roller, and it actually has a bit of an angle on it so that as it's holding, not only does it hold the shell down against the main rollers, but it's on a slight angle steering this way, essentially trying to steer itself in this direction out of the shell. However, because the backstop roller is there and because this is fixed in place behind that roller, the net effect is that it pulls the shell in towards the backstop roller as long as it's moving in this direction. If it moves in the other direction, you see it has the opposite effect. So the system is not entirely foolproof. You've got to make absolutely sure that the shell never starts rolling this way. Um, at least until you're clear of the saw blade. And we're into the blade. We can see that gets that happens very quickly. So we have to be clear of the blade. And then once the blade is out of the way, you can actually use that to roll your shell out of the jig, if that seems necessary. So that's the concept behind this little table saw sled. And as long as you have a clean, even factory edge on the back side of the shell, then that will be mirrored on this side. If for some reason your shell doesn't have a true edge, then you'll have to build a truing jig, but I don't have one of those. For better or for worse, I tend to trust Keller's factory edges. So far, I haven't had any problems with them. So the next most important tool that I needed for making and modifying drums is a router table. Now, there are various commercially available ones, but they seem to be more focused on running things through in a linear fashion like you would with a table saw. So instead, I decided to build my own, kind of built to purpose, and I went and got a Craig jig that actually is recessed into a three-quarter inch melamine tabletop that's backed with another piece of three-quarter inch plywood. So I wanted to be able to keep this as flat as I could manage. And then you use this little handle right here to raise and lower the bit. And that makes it really easy for setting my depth and getting the chamfer bit just right when I'm cutting a bearing edge. So right now I have a uh, three quarter inch hog in there doing some other project, which I'll be showing in this video later. But it's a great jig. It can be adjusted to fit any number of uh, router motors. And you just use this little tool, pop off the guide, then you can raise it up enough to get in there and get at the bit and change that out. And there's a few different sizes of these things, depending on the kind of bit you're using. Now, dimensionally, this thing's two feet by three feet. And I put the router side, put the router itself kind of over to one side so that on smaller shells, you know, six inches to about 13 inches, we kind of got the run of the table. But for larger shells, like, for example, this is a cutoff from my 26-inch bass drum. You know, in the case of this, when I need to cut an edge, I just run it around like that until I hit uh, whatever my stopping point is, until I finish cutting the edge. And then in the same fashion, I can change the bit orientation to do the countercut in the same way. So there's enough flat area to hold the shell flat and keep it in place while the bit does its work. And the other thing I did when I built the table, I wanted to make absolutely sure with something spinning this fast that I had a very simple foolproof safety switch. So when the thing's running, I can, I can slap this thing stopped nice and quick. So that's basically how this thing is set up. For now, because of the location I've got it in, there's not actually a wall behind here, so I had to make kind of a false wall. I put a little shelf up here for my router bits and the tools that I need with this thing, a pair of safety giggles. And uh, so yeah, it's a good little setup. Something else we could take a look at here. After my dad's passing, I inherited his shop and all of the tools and this workbench and everything. So I'm eventually gonna repurpose this into my new drum building workbench. Um, but I gotta do some major rearranging around this garage and 
move some wiring and some of the plumbing for the air compressor and all of that niftiness. But one of the first steps I took though was, if you see that shelf with the blue bins on top of it, that used to contain numerous soup tins and pill bottles and things with all kinds of nuts and bolts and parts. And instead, I've put everything in these little tiny shop drawers, uh, some of which includes a lot of my drum hardware. So expect to see some progress on that at some point. So speaking of workbenches, one of the first major constructs I put together before I started building Project 303 was to make myself a workbench in the apartment. Because at that point, that was my main workspace, was the spare bedroom of my apartment. So I put together a couple of tables that fit together in an L shape, which are a frightful mess right now. My apologies, but so the bench is a mess, but we can still get a look at a few things. Uh, one of one thing we can observe here is a little tool stand I built. So I've got a clip to hold my tape measure and various slots for drum keys and screwdrivers and very specific Allen wrench size for doing the DW air vents and my step bit for drilling all of the many, many millions of holes that go in each drum. Then there's another little device I built in there because I needed some kind of a, a horse to put the drum shells on when I was working on them, either for wrapping or um, not really sanding. I wasn't doing that, but like drilling, drilling holes in the shell, I'd kind of use this thing as a base for that, just slide the shell onto here and then start drilling my holes with that. And I made it in such a way that you just take this bolt out and the thing tucks out of the way and nobody trips on it or gives themselves a contusion trying to walk through there. Now, as things improve in the garage, I'll be repurposing this. It won't really have much to do with the drums after that. A couple of other items worth pointing out here. For doing the Delmar wraps on shells, I got a J roller so that I could uh, compress the wrap on the shell and work out any air bubbles that might be in there. And actually had to order this thing online because when you go to a, a Lowe's Depot and try and explain to them what a J-Roller is, they look at you like a goat staring at a new fence. So I like to keep plenty of ribbons around for uh, doing snare wires. Always good to have scissors. Um, sanding block just in case something needs touched up. This is, the, this is kind of a straight saw that I use for cutting the wrap because when you just put the corner of it along my straight edge, it actually scores a nice little line and after a couple of passes, it doesn't take very long to get through the wrap and get a reasonably clean cut. Sometimes I find it's best just to use this thing to do that first main score and then I'll break this little guy out and use that for the final, um, use that for the final cut in order to get a nice clean edge. It's also worth noting that I like to keep uh, various kinds of tape around here, either for marking the drum shells um, and drilling later on, or just to temporarily hold some things in place, like uh, I'm out of wax paper right now, but I like to use a lot of wax paper when I'm wrapping drums so I can get the alignment right without sticking the shell together permanently. The Tessa tape for bonding the seam, uh, various kinds of squares right here, so that I can get nice vertical lines along the shell and get accurate measurements when I'm laying out the hardware locations. And one other noteworthy item, when I talked about cutting the Delmar, I went ahead and made a straight edge. And what I did was took a couple of sticks of three quarter inch plywood and laminated them together and used that to reinforce a piece of aluminum channel, like one inch by one inch or inch and a half by inch and a half. And then I put a screw in this end and this is why it's good to have a workbench that you don't care too much about because what I'll do is I'll clamp the other end of this to the end of the table and then screw this down at the other end. And with the wrap pinned in between there, that wrap isn't going anywhere. And then you can make a nice clean cut without it getting all wonky or screwed up. And thus far, it has stayed straight as an arrow through a couple of drum kits worth of cutting. Well, actually, if you count all of Project 303, it's made it through several drum kits worth of uh, wrap cutting. This was another one of those, had to build this thing before I started the entire project, because 
having nice clean straight cuts is critical if you don't want to waste material and I don't want to waste material. And the final piece of the puzzle is my drum storage closet. The over here I repurposed one of my wire racks to serve as kind of drum head storage and I've also stashed my bins for remote pedals and things like that. I've also got another bin down there for just general hardware. And then all of these shelves here for storing the drums and uh, various bits of hardware. I need to make a rack for storing the cymbals. That'll be another project. But like I took some of these bits of PVC pipe that my dad had in the garage and made holders for my floor tom legs that don't have memory locks on them. So uh, PDP tom tom legs, and Pearl, um, and then this is kind of the Orphan. I don't know where these came from, but somehow they ended up in my collection, Tom Tom Legs. So anyway, and then I've got to come up with some means of storing the hardware because it kind of gets placed wherever it's convenient. There's quite a lot of room for storing drums in here, which is good because I got quite a lot of drums. And that was quite a little project. I took two by fours as uprights, used my router table in that wood hog bit that I was talking about to notch out areas for some one by fours to sit in and then laid some, I think three eighths OSB as shelves on top of that. And it's very utilitarian. It's not very pretty looking, but it does a bang up job of holding everything up off of the floor here. It doesn't really flood terribly, but the water does come in in this area. And if it springs a leak or anything, I don't want my bass drums or something like that kind of sitting at ground level, getting, uh, quietly soaking up all that moisture. So this serves to elevate everything up off the ground. So anyway, that's the nuts and bolts of what I use to make my drums and kind of an ersatz shop tour. And I don't just build drums. I build the stuff that I need to store all those drums. So anyway, that should just about wrap it for this one. I'm Mike Lindsay. Thanks for coming out.